Welcome to Below the Line, where we talk about working in Hollywood from the crew perspective. My name is Skid. I'm a former assistant director and your host. Three weeks ago, I spoke about the Writers Guild of America strike with Lowell Peterson, executive director for WGA East. And one of the factors we discussed was the degree to which other film industry unions were aligned with the WGA. Today, as a follow-up, I'm joined by representatives from some of those other unions. First, Tyler McIntosh, you are the political legislative director for the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees, or IATSE. Welcome back to the show. Thanks, Kid. Good to be here. Glad you're here as well, Tyler. Also returning, Carrie Wood Enertson, you are the national director for government affairs and public policy on behalf of the Screen Actors Guild, American Federation of Television and Radio Artists, or SAG-AFTRA. Nice to see you again. Thanks, Kid. Great to be here, too. And finally, we're joined again by Michael Wasser. Michael, you work for the Department for Professional Employees, also known as DPE, which as an umbrella organization includes WGA East, IATSE, SAG-AFTRA, and the Directors Guild of America, among others. And your title is Assistant to the President and Legislative Director. Thanks for being here. Great to be back. I'm really glad all of you could be back today. Now, listeners, if you're joining us for the first time, it might be worthwhile to first catch my previous conversation with Lowell, especially if you have questions about the issues the WGA is striking over. I released that episode on May 21st. As of today's release date, the strike is into its second month. I'll open up the floor. Is there any news to share? Has there been any progress made? Skid, the progress that that we've seen uh, at DPE, which is, of course, from outside the negotiations room. I think the progress that we've seen is the amount of solidarity uh, from people inside the film and television industry, but also far beyond it, teachers, construction workers, all types of working people, walking picket lines, joining rallies, joining in with the Writers Guild in their fight for a fair contract. But in terms of what's happening between the Writers Guild and the AMPTP, I don't think we know of any major updates at this point. Well, that is interesting. And Will and I discussed, as I mentioned earlier in the show, this idea of solidarity between the unions. Let's start there. Carrie, tell us how SAG-AFTRA has taken to the writer's strike. Sure, Skid. Sure, Skid. Really happy and proud to say that since day one, our members have been out on the lines for the writers. Uh, We have organized uh, our members to be picketing almost daily, you know, every week since they started striking at several different locations. And our members have really gone out in force to support the writers. And, you know, we're all kind of in this together, as they say. Tyler, let me turn to you. For folks who are not aware, IATSE, you represent most of the crafts, the working folks on set. And I can imagine a scenario where as shows shut down, a lot of your members might be out of work. But tell us what the position of the union has been and how it's playing out. Absolutely. I think much like Carrie just noted from SAG-AFTRA, there's been unprecedented solidarity behind the scenes, entertainment workers represented by IATSE. Uh, IATSE supports the Writers Guild of America West and Writers Guild of America East in their fight to win a fair contract. Uh, That's our position. That is the position uh, of all of the entertainment unions because As you just noted, we are all standing together here. A fair contract for WGA members is better for every IATSE member. These are an ensemble of media mega corporations worth trillions of dollars. So standing with the writers in their struggle to win a fair contract, that's not only the right thing to do, but it's also an opportunity for us to build solidarity amongst our members and amongst rank and file entertainment workers. So our members have also been out on the line joining all of the WGA pickets, along with our brothers, sisters, and kin from across the entertainment unions in their fight for a fair contract, because we are all in this one together. Tyler, in terms of contract, I recall that IATSE nearly went on strike two years ago yourselves. Tell us about the status of your contract and how the current action by the writers might affect your future negotiations. Absolutely. If you'll recall, Really, the last two major film and TV negotiations that the AMPTP engaged in uh, were our narrowly avoided strike. Uh, We were had a strike authorized and came right up to the last 24 hours when a deal was reached and we won a fair contract for our below the line workers. 
Uh, but there was that instance and now a writer's strike. Uh, it is it is really beyond the pale that the AMPTP is engaged in, in this level of resistance uh, at a time when the corporations who control the industry, they're really seeing sky-high profits uh, and sky-high executive pay. I, I think there's no question that the AMPTP is responsible for this strike, and, and you have to look no further than what we experienced back in 2021. And certainly our members are looking at this strike as building solidarity, of course, for our negotiations. We are uh, going to be going really last in this cycle. You've got the WGA strike. Uh, the Directors Guild is engaged in current negotiations, and uh, as I know, Carrie will discuss, sag is going to be in negotiations as well. Our negotiations are set for next year in 2024 is when our three-year agreement is up. But many of the issues that are at play here with the writers are, are certainly issues that, that our membership is watching closely and that the writers are fighting for, you know, minimum pay, streaming conditions, staffing minimums, uh, restrictions on the use of AI to undermine compensation and creative rights. These are shared issues across our industry. So it's certainly going to affect all of us, the outcome uh, of this strike. So Tyler, you mentioned that the SAG-AFTRA was uh, going to negotiations. Carrie, give us a sense of what that process is going to look like for your union. Sure, Skid. We sent out an authorization vote to the members. We need a 75% margin to pass. Obviously, the union is is hoping that we get, you know, as as much of a, a high of a yes vote as possible. It just makes us look stronger going into negotiations and, you know, united for a fair contract. And just to note, this is the contract we will be, we are negotiating is the TV theatrical contract. So that includes motion pictures, dramatic content, and streaming, which is a big sticking point. But this authorization does not mean we're going to strike. It just means that the national board and the negotiating committee is empowered to go out on strike if they deem that, you know, a necessary action to do at the end of negotiations on June 30th. Obviously, this is we're, we're looking at this as a last resort. We don't want to go out. But as Tyler mentioned, there are several principles. Actually, there's four big ones that we are going to be really focusing on that's economic fairness or compensation, it's residuals and the way they're received, particularly on the streaming platforms. AI is a huge sticking point for our members as well. And then there's sort of another issue uh, that's very specific to actors about self-tapes and how they're submitted. So those are kind of the four pillars that we will be discussing. And and, um, this authorization basically empowers our board to decide at the end of the negotiations at the end, when our contract expires on June 30th, whether they, they will need to strike or not. Now, the DGA hasn't joined us today. As Tyler, you also mentioned, their negotiations are currently underway. But I'm wondering if we could take a step back. Michael, the unions overall and on these issues, what coordinations or negotiations are happening at maybe your level or what you see? Sure, Skid. So I can speak to the DPE's role has, has been to help raise awareness among unions outside of film and television. That includes unions uh, in the broader arts, entertainment, and media industries. So think of unions in uh, live theater, music, opera, ballet, dance, and also unions in other industries from education to healthcare, professional services, nonprofits. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, we've seen immediate support in the way of folks showing up to join picket lines. We've seen that across cities in New York, in California, in Washington, D.C., where I'm talking to you from uh, at events where we've seen employers using the content that the writers helped create to sort of tell the story about themselves, but conveniently leaving out a little information about what's going on at the bargaining table. So trying to raise awareness among the public about that. And I think what we've seen is that obviously there, you can hear it in Tyler and Carrie's explanations of their own individual unions issues. You know, some of this is technical and, and specific to the entertainment industry, but when you pull back and get beyond the, the jargon, it's issues that resonate with many, many working people, certainly many working professionals. We're hearing the richest corporations in the world ask their employees to work longer for less pay, to take on more of the risk without any compensation on for doing so. We're talking about uh, more precarity fewer opportunities for career advancement. And, and those are the messages that are resonating and, and we're helping to support 
the writers and WGA by making sure folks know how they can plug into to supporting those efforts. Because as you can tell here, no single union's bargaining happens in a vacuum. What happens for the writers obviously is going to impact SAG after and IETSC members, but it's also going to impact teachers and it's going to impact other industries who can see uh, what is and isn't possible. Well, give me more of a sense of how this support is manifesting. I think first, we've all mentioned that members of other unions and the public at large are showing up on the picket line. Give me more sense about how now, again, that we're into the second month. How are the picket lines looking? What's it like to be there? Tell our listeners more about what they could expect if they join themselves. Well, I can tell you that the condition of the picket line is strong. And I can say that firsthand from places even that are not traditional uh, production centers as we think of them. I was just uh, at an informational leaflet uh, that Michael just alluded to a little bit uh, in Washington, D.C. last week. The Motion Picture Association was uh, hosting a screening of uh, Disney's Little Mermaid, uh, the new uh, live action production, in the middle of, of a strike, which is particularly galling to be using that opportunity to advocate amongst lawmakers and congressional staff and others um, about the industry uh, without acknowledging the ongoing labor strike that's taking place. And so um, I know that DPE, uh, helping uh, coordinate with the AFL-CIO, staged uh, an informational picket of that event. Um, we also did another one the prior week for uh, Comcast NBC Universal screening of the newest installment of the Fast and Furious franchise, Fast 10. Um, both very successful pickets with SAG-AFTRA members and IATSE members, and really union support from across the movement. I mean, we had DWA members and AFSCME members and firefighters, et cetera. Um, so the support is is not only strong just amongst entertainment unions, um, but the solidarity amongst workers has really been manifest on the lines. Uh, and that goes you know, from the rank and file, but all the way up to our leadership. I know President Loeb um, just spoke at a rally uh, at Fox uh, in New York and joined previous uh, guest, our, our brother, uh, Executive Director Lowell Peterson of Writers Guild of America East. So from the leadership, you know, on down uh, to the rank and file, I think the solidarity has been absolutely unprecedented. And our members' unwillingness to cross picket lines uh, has also been steadfast. And these are folks who are, of course, sacrificing a day's work uh, and sometimes more depending on how long these productions are shut down. So it has a very real economic impact. So the fact that the picket lines are as strong and as plentiful in attendance as we've seen is really, I think that's even more of a testament, uh, given the fact that workers are in fact sacrificing pay uh, in order to remain in solidarity with the writers who are on strike. Piggybacking on what Tyler has said, a lot of our members outside of the LA and New York production homes have been out on the lines. I just saw a couple of days ago, our members in Chicago were out in force um, on the line. And, you know, we've seen as many as or an average of like 200 members per picket, and we've had as many as three per day since day one. So really proud to stand together. Everyone realizes, I think we all realize that the issues that the writers are facing and bargaining right now are all of our issues. And I know that we all feel, all, all of our collective members are in very heavy solidarity over these issues and uh, you know dealing with compensation and residuals and, and all that. And I think there's a common understanding that um, for some of the issues, you know, we, we have to do it now. Skate, I'll just add on to what Carrie and Tyler said that in addition to those informational leaflets in Washington, D.C., I accompanied DPE President Jennifer Dorning uh, in New York to a picket line a couple weeks ago and a thousand plus people. It's uh, it's sort of a, in some ways, at, for a second, you start to realize it's a little odd feeling because obviously the issue is serious. You're talking about writers who have given up pay to stand in a line for a fair contract. You know, this is super serious here, but it, it's fun it's a joyous experience on the line in terms of what it feels like. And that joy and that feeling of fun is because I think people realize and feel just how righteous this is in terms of uh, standing up to make sure that the future of writing as a career can be sustained, that people who want to pursue this for a living and recognizing that this is a way to make a living have that ability going forward. So it's definitely something I would encourage folks to find a picket line near them and to experience it for themselves, to experience what it means to be in it together uh, to improve your lives, to improve your communities, to improve your workplaces. Now, recognizing that all of you represent your organizations here in D.C., what can be done at the legislative level? 
Skip, I, I don't want to get ahead of uh, of Writers Guild's own answer to that for themselves, but I, I think I'll say from an observational standpoint, I think that these are companies that benefit from federal tax dollars, tax breaks. I think these are uh, companies that have a big impact in the communities of many, many members of Congress. So their constituents are impacted. And I'll also say that this is probably one of the biggest contract disputes where AI has been central. And this is obviously something where Congress just a few weeks ago had several hearings on and they're going to continue trying to figure that out uh, how public policy relates to AI. So I think that's the other element here in this negotiation. That's exactly right. I was uh, going to add that, you know, we've done uh, several high level meetings there in Washington uh, focusing on the issue of AI and how to tackle it and how, you know, sort of the guardrails, as they say, that we need to establish for our industry to keep our jobs protected. So we've sort of tackled it from that view. But other than that, you know, I would say uh, getting the support of some of our very senior administration officials and congressional officials um, it will be important um, over the summer. And so we sort of come at it from a, you know, garnering support angle and also from, you know, discussing options on dealing with the huge looming issue of AI for our industry. And for IATSE, I can say our experience from our last contract fight with the AMPTP in the fall of, of 2021, certainly, you know, the practical nature of the bargaining, of course, has to happen at the table between the parties subject to the contract. However, as both Michael and Carrie have alluded to, Congressional support, uh, support from elected officials is always a factor. Uh, these are folks who are elected to help shape the laws that govern the industries in which we work. So having those folks voicing support for the cause is always helpful. We had uh, in our contract fight a congressional letter sent to the head of the AMPTP signed by 120 members of Congress. Uh, saying that, you know, the issues that uh, we were fighting for as far as uh, reasonable rest and fair pay, et cetera, were ideals with which they were aligned and urged both sides back to the table. And this was at a time when the AMPTP had walked away from the table. Um, and I'm not saying that was the only thing that forced them back, but certainly that pressure and support helped and ultimately a averted a strike in our case. So, Certainly, it's an element of the process. It's uh, it's certainly not something where, you know, Congress alone could effectuate the end of this strike. However, the support is always a factor. It's fantastic to see so much support for this action. And as you said, it tying into the labor movement in general. It's a strong time in this country, I think, to, to really look at these issues and how they're going to affect us all. When Lowell was on a couple of weeks ago, he noted that they have a website WGA contract 2023.org, where people can go, it lists opportunities to join picket lines, you can make donations, you get more information. Are there other things that people can do to show their support that you would recommend both to your members and to the public at large? I'll say that, Gid, for DPE, we've been advising our affiliates and advising the members of our affiliates that, you know, pay attention to Writers Guild social media, pay attention to that website because they do. Uh, offer opportunities to join those picket lines. If you can't do it uh, in person, there's always opportunities to show your support uh, on social media. And then, of course, we were talking about members of Congress. It's always uh, good to remind members of Congress that they have constituents who care about working people getting a fair deal and a fair return on their work. So that's always uh, another way that people can express support. But maybe Tyler and Carrie can talk about specifics for their members of their unions. Yes. Our portion of our website, sagafter.org, is now currently uh, dedicated to uh, not only the writer strike, our own authorization. And so I would just encourage, you know, particularly members of SAGAFTER, you know, stay up to date on our site. We're keeping, we're updating it frequently. We're sending out a lot of emails. We're going to keep everybody updated on our own process, as well as the writers and where to pick it. Social media, as Michael mentioned, is going to be hugely important in terms of getting the word out. Yeah, and for IATSE members, I would just agree completely with both Michael and Carrie, and looking to the WGA and their website for their updated picket schedules and locations to be monitoring that closely. As I mentioned earlier in the pod, 
we certainly have a lot of members who are foregoing work uh, during this strike, and that solidarity uh, certainly has uh, not gone unnoticed. And, you know, the international, uh, you know, has informed all of our local unions, our motion picture and television unions, that that, um, every IA member has legal rights during the WGA's dispute with the companies. Uh, And we've sent a review of all of our major collective bargaining agreements in the film, television, and commercial production industries to the members of our motion picture and television locals, informing them of their rights and their ability to continue to honor these picket lines uh, without being permanently replaced. And so um, we would just say continue the solidarity, uh, and we plan to, to be in this fight to the very end with WGA. Well, I think these are important issues. I really appreciate you guys coming on the show to help explain them to folks that have more questions. Wishing you luck. On that note, we're going to call it a wrap. Great having you guys here. Thanks again. Thanks again. Thanks again. Thank you. Listeners, I always appreciate your feedback. You'll find my contact info at our website, below the line, one word, dot biz. That's B-I-Z. You'll also find past episodes and links to all of our social media, so check it out. A quick postscript. In the time between recording and publication of this podcast, there were two relevant developments. First, after negotiations that ran just under four weeks, the DGA reached a tentative agreement with the AMPTP, and the membership is currently voting whether to accept or reject that agreement. Second, SAG AFTER members voted 97.91% in favor of a strike authorization ahead of their negotiations, which formally got underway on June 7th. How these developments affect the WGA strike are still TBD, but I'm hoping we'll get someone back on the show to talk about it. Until then, here are my closing credits. Thanks to Curtis Five for our music, John Juan for our logo, and to all of our listeners, I appreciate you. Please rate us wherever you get your podcasts. Tell your friends. Thanks again from Below the Line.